Today is July 27th, 2020. My name is Dana Yarrick. I'm interviewing Luis Flores for the Latino Oral History Project, Voces of a Pandemic Project at the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. This project is in partnership with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Flores, that this interview will be placed in the Northern Illinois University Libraries and shared with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you do wanna talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record, record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree, after each one. There are several questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. The Center for Latino and Latin American Studies wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs or other documentation, at the Northern Illinois University Libraries. Northern Illinois University Libraries will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies at Northern Illinois University. One, do you give the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Northern Illinois University Libraries? Yes, I agree. Do you grant Northern Illinois University Libraries right, title, and interest in copyright over the interview and any materials you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow Northern Illinois University Libraries to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Do you grant the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies consent to share your interview and your materials with the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? Yes, I agree. We have many questions in a pre-interview form that we have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure BOSE server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before BOSE sends it to the Benson Library and NIU libraries, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library and NIU libraries. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson and NIU libraries? Yes, I agree. On occasion, the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies and BOSES receive requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Who is Luis Flores? Okay, so I mean, just a little bit about myself. Um, I was born in Chicago. I kind of moved around the area a little bit um, throughout my childhood. I, I lived in Chicago around Humble Park for a couple of years, and then I moved to Israel and lived there for a couple of years. And then I moved to Oswego, Illinois, which is about um, like a five minute drive from Aurora. Um, I went from there, I lived in DeKalb, when I went to NIU for during my college years, and then moved back to Oswego after I graduated, and now I live in Chicago again in um, the Pilsen area. Um, uh, growing up, I mean, you know, I mean, I had my ups and downs and stuff like that. Um, I did, uh, what's it called, kind of saw myself a little bit more on the trades field when I was a kid, but my mom convinced me otherwise to go to, to, into the medical field. Um, my parents separated when I was in my teen years, my early teen years, so that was kind of bogus, but I mean, it happens, right? Um, my mother remarried black. Um, other than that, I'm the oldest of uh, five other siblings, so it's six of us total. Uh, two of them are from my stepfather and they're beautiful kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, long story short, um, I went to high school at Morden East, and then I went to Oswego High School, graduated from there, went to NIU, got my bachelor's in nursing, 
Um, and now I'm practicing in the field. So you have been working on the front lines as a nurse during COVID-19. Um, let's begin by talking a little bit about where you work and the population it serves. Okay. So I work at Christ Medical Center and it's located in Oakland, Illinois. Uh, Oakland is uh, pretty south of Chicago um, as far as the patient populations that we serve. Uh, we do serve, um, Actually, it's a quite diverse population of people that we serve. Um, Oakland itself has a pretty significant um, uh, Muslim population. Um, there's also Indian. Uh, we also serve the Black and Latino communities as well, too. So I want to say as far as the patients that we get, it, it varies. It's very diverse. And uh, our staff is uh, also equivalent to that diversity as well. So we had different doctors from different backgrounds taking care of patients. Um, when you use a call center, you're gonna notice there's like five, six different options for uh, different type of uh, languages that you could use for a call service and stuff like that. But I would say our patient population is pretty diverse. And um, Christ Medical Center itself is a level one trauma center and it's also a cardiac hospital as well. But we do all, we do also, you know, different procedures and stuff like that um, throughout the hospital. So the hospital being a very large hospital and a level one trauma center, as well as the cardiac specialty, how have they balanced, how have they been able to balance care with the entry of the COVID-19 crisis? So, yeah, as far as care goes, during the beginning of the crisis, um, a lot of procedures were kind of put on hold to see what was going on. Um, but now it's getting a little bit better, um, now that it's a little bit more manageable and the cases have been going down. But in the beginning, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a, a difficulty to balance it because a lot of the efforts were going towards, um, you know, the COVID-19 effort and stuff like that. Um, but just as far as balancing procedures, a lot of it was, if it's a life threatening emergency, then of course they would, um, you know, bring the patients and do procedures like uh, emergency stents for heart uh, failure, or for heart attacks and stuff like that. That was still going on. Um, as far as testing for exposure prior to the procedures, it's gotten a little bit better before um, patients and doctors that were taking care of these patients didn't know if they were positive or not. So no, we had those rapid tests that would test them immediately. But in the beginning, it was just kind of a standstill with it. But now it's getting a little bit better. And you began receiving training as an ICU nurse in March just yeah. as your hospital was receiving more COVID patients. Can you tell us what that was like? So during my training as an ICU nurse, uh, it was pretty hectic in the beginning. Nobody knew who was positive. And so we had everybody just scattered out throughout the hospital. And there were a couple of patients that were starting to show symptoms of it um, that had no prior exposure before coming into the hospital. So a lot of patients were getting the illness and um, as far as just managing those patients, a lot of units were being created to make sure that they were housed in one area, so to speak. Um, we, had a, we had a OB unit on the sixth floor that had to get moved to the second floor so that way that unit could be used as a COVID unit. Now when that was happening, um, I think we had a total of, you know, one, I, want, I want to say we had like about five units that were just dedicated to strictly COVID patients. Um, now we're down to, I want to say two units, but in the beginning, uh, just witnessing that, it was, it was something. Um, in the hospital, there's some floors where there could be two patients in a room when COVID started happening, they stopped the two patient room um, practice and just had only one person per room. 
just to contain, like, just to make sure that people were safe and not, you know, infecting each other or, like, at least patients at the very least, infecting other patients. So it was just one patient per room at that point. Um, but as far as the COVID rooms, though, so, um, they're, they're allowing two patients per room that were positive for COVID because patients already got it but um yeah in the beginning it was pretty hectic to see and then i was picking up extra shifts too just to help with the efforts but i was trying to make sure i was avoiding the core rooms as much as possible <laughs> and you were a rookie i mean you're you're there sort of to be have orientation and to learn how, how did that make you feel you know all of a sudden this this whole situation is exploding around you but I guess it's just one of those moments where, like, you know, everything that you learn in school and practice, like, it's all down to the wire type of thing, right? Um, so in the beginning, trying to understand, like, what this disease does was kind of the first priority and what it attacks and how it's indicative to the risk factors that they were talking about. So a lot of it started with, one, educating myself on what this virus is. And then my second priority was, okay, now that I understand what this virus is, now what are my duties as a future ICU nurse at that point to manage and what to look for and what I need to do to make sure that these, these patients are safe. Um, and yeah, it was, it was definitely one of those call of duty type of moments. Um, and then nurses started getting sick too from my hospital. They had to get quarantined. So we were definitely, uh, you know, the next ones to go into those COVID rooms. So I was just like, oh, okay, this, this is it. This is what, this is what we signed up for, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> just looking at each other like, okay. Yeah, so um, and in the beginning when the, the PPE issue was happening, oh, man, um, a lot of those uh, – stores were true we did have to put our n95s in a brown paper bag because we were running out and we also had to use our same gowns for the same room for the ship just to preserve it um and when i was talking to my colleagues that work days um they would ask the doctors or they would that the doctors would call the patient's room and speak to them just to one not go in the room and to, to preserve PP so that way, you know, the nurses were able to do that. Um, but the biggest thing that um, I saw that people were scared about is when patients have to get intubated because it's kind of like when you're digging for oil, right? And when you find it in the ground, it just spritz everywhere. It's the same concept with exposure with COVID. So if the patient is positive for COVID and all of a sudden their oxygen needs start to increase and they're having trouble breathing, once you put a tube down their the, once you put a tube down their throat and into their lungs, all of that, um, all of any like any type of uh, sources like any like anything in their lungs pre becomes aerosolized and that makes the virus stay in the air longer. So it was just like only four or five people were allowed in the room to make sure that these patients were intubated safely. Um, we had to make sure we were covered and making sure we had our face masks, our N95s and, you know, the, I think the anesthesiologist would wear the, suit, the body suit just to be double, triple safe, but yeah, it was it was interesting to see all that stuff, and they were very strict about like limiting the amount of people that would go in the rooms for those type of procedures. So, uh, what is caring for COVID patients like? Other than that, there's the intubation, but what are uh, your daily duties in working with the COVID patients? Can you describe that? Right. So, we're working with COVID patients, a lot of the duties. Um, a lot of it was just making sure that their oxygen levels would be go would go up if they weren't intubated, because a lot of these guys, whenever they didn't have their oxygen or whatever they um, didn't wear their masks or like even the nasal cannula, 
um, they would go down pretty quick and we have to remind them like, hey, you have to put this on. They didn't really like that that much, but it was just a constant reminder and let them know, like, if you don't put this on, you know, the next thing that we're going to have to do is, you know, intubate if it keeps going down. But, I mean, it's not like, you know, like we'll try everything before doing that. In the beginning, it was kind of like if you look like you're having COVID, the symptoms look like COVID, you get intubated before anything else happens. Um, but as far as taking care of them, so we, as nurses, we try to minimize ourselves going into the room. So what we would do is try to, at the very least, go in the room at least four times per shift. So that way we would minimize our exposure. So if we go in the room and we forget something, it's not like we could just walk out. We're wearing our PPE and just putting all that on is about like a two to three minute task sometimes. And so there would be a runner. It could be a, a nursing assistant or a nurse themselves that would go around and if you were, if you needed something or you forgot something, you would knock on the window, open the door a little bit and just ask for what you need. Um, and if let's say the patient had to be cleaned up or anything like that, it would be the runner that would help and come in and like help you take care of them and stuff like that, clean them up, wipe them down, change the sheets. And then we would dump the sheets in a bag and then there would be a little drawer that would open up toward the other side. And so once we put it in there, then we would open that drawer and double bag it from the outside. And if we didn't have that, then we would, what we would do is we would just take out the garbage or the linen and then just put it by the door and then they would double bag it outside the door. Mm -hmm. But in some units, you didn't have... Um, uh, runner coming in and out. It would just be the nurses, but this is more of those uh, ECMO patients that um, were a little, like they were pretty much like a little bit up there as far as like doing it. Like, like you were the one responsible for like doing everything as the nurse. Um, there wouldn't be like a, a PCM for maybe a runner, but you would do everything for the patient. So you mentioned the ECMO machines. Um, can you explain a little bit what that is? And my understanding is that Christ Medical was one, one of the first hospitals to try to use that as an alternative to the ventilator. Was it because of a lack of ventilators or how did that come about? So ECMO, um, the practice for ECMO, well, let me tell you what ECMO means or what it stands for. ECMO stands for ECMO corporeal membrane oxygenation. So ECMO was something that the, uh, cardiovascular surgeons started using because uh, ECMO allows your body to have a break as far as its function, its use of the of like lungs and heart, depending on what their needs are. So essentially, what happens is if the patient is on the ventilator, correct, and they're still not doing well, then the next step would be ECMO, and so. What ECMO is, is a machine that pumps blood away from you. Well, it pumps blood from the cannulation from your body, kind of like bypass, where it takes the blood away from your body, it brings it into an oxygenizer, and then once the carbon dioxide and oxygen, once the carbon dioxide is swept out of your body and the oxygen is placed, then it gets sent back to your body. And depending on the need that your body needs, there's two type of ECMO. Well, there's like, I want to say there's like three type of ec like ECMOs that you can be put under. You can get uh, VA ECMO, which is from uh, venous to arterial return, or you get VV ECMO, which is venous, venous return. So venous, venous return ECMO, that in itself is, uh, it's when um, it returns, it takes blood away from your body and returns it to the lungs. The A ECMO is, it takes blood away from the body and it returns to the heart and lungs. So 
So VA ECMO works both for your heart and lungs, and VV ECMO just is just for your lungs. VA ECMO is a little bit more complex because it involves the heart too. But what that does is it gives your body a break from using those th those organs, but more specifically the lungs. It gives your lungs a break. It's kind of like when when you're working out and you know how you feel burning and like those lactic acids type of thing. It's the same concept with the ventilator and with ECMO. It's, it's giving that your body a rest from having to use all those um, muscles for your lungs, more specifically the diaphragm. Because what happens when you're using a muscle too much and it starts getting tired and it starts to stop, right? That was the biggest fear with patients who were having respiratory issues. You know, the diaphragm just all of a sudden starts to get weaker and weaker and the respiration starts to get more shallow and shallower. That's how you have respiratory collapse. So um, ECMO, what, ECMO, using ECMO was one of our, Christ using ECMO was one of the new things that were uh, pretty much put on like trial to see if it would work. And it's been working significantly. Um, we've had patients come back from like maybe being staying in the hospital from one to two months, um, coming back and being able to do things I know a little bit. Um, as far as the long-term damage, I mean, I don't really get to see too much of that, but as far as the procedures that are being done, it's pretty extraordinary. Have you had uh, patients that you're caring for die while they're there? Um, unfortunately, I mean, it's just one of those realities, uh, especially with this type of pandemic. Uh, we do have uh, people that do die as far as patients under my care that died from ECMO. Um, I haven't, thank goodness, but I have taken care of people who are, do not resuscitate, you know, just pretty much making them comfortable. Um, and for good reasons too, especially if they, everything that's been done for them and at one point, at some point in time, patients just had enough. I mean, they've gone through so much. A lot of that stuff that patients do go through, uh, as far as like getting intubated, being sedated, and it, you do you do get PTSD from that. You see long term effects from those procedures and stuff like that, from getting from scars, from getting ec like cannulated for ECMO. Like you see these big holes coming either from their chest or from their neck. Um, you see people um, with issues breathing or getting up now because they've been intubated for so long. It gets to a point where patients just don't want to do it anymore and they just want to, you know, accept what's to come. Um, but as far as when they pass, I mean, I've heard stories about couple, like a couple that passed within hours of each other. I've heard stories of, of kids that um, 12, 10 years old that have passed in the hospital. Um, and when when they pass away when, and become um, DNRs, uh, I mean, a lot of it's just starting to be more like hospice treatment at some point if they're starting to become more responsive. Um, they're, they're gasping for air. They're, they look red when they pass away, um, but it's it's quite a sight to see. How do you deal with that personally, having to experience that? You spoke right. about P PTSD. It's kind of that affects you as well. Right. So um, it did affect me. Um, I'm actually going to counseling right now um, in downtown with perceptions. Um, they've been pretty great with, um, you know, just checking up and just talking about some of the things that we talk about. Um, my mentality was, well, becoming an ICU nurse is that, you know, everybody, I'm, I'm going to save everybody. Like, I'm going to be that nurse, right? I'm going to, I'm gonna, like, this is something that, like, you know, like, this is a higher level of care. It's like, this is where people come make that turnaround when it comes to ICU. And a lot of the cases, that's not what it is. It's actually... It's actually 50 50 from what I've seen. So I have been talking to somebody. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of people that I can't talk to that isn't in the field already. And 
the current social media stuff and everybody that thinks they're doctors, <laughs> you know, they, that doesn't help either because it's like if you're not there to see what it does, of course you're not going to believe it because you're not going to see it, right? It's just one of those things you got to see it to believe it type of thing. Um, but, yeah, I've definitely been um, making sure that my mental health is okay with that, especially since, um, you know, it was getting to that point. Yeah, but I'm gonna make sure I'm taking care of myself. <laughs> Good. Mm-hmm. Um, how about your impact as a Latinx healthcare professional? Right. So I'm glad you brought that up. I have noticed there are a lot of Latinx patients in the hospital that are on ECMO, and a lot of a lot more uh, black patients as well too. Now, in the beginning, I didn't really notice it until I go, went to the ECMO units or the ECMO unit that we have in our hospital. And um, just imagine trying to ask for something and nobody understands you. Like you're, you're trying to communicate with somebody um, and you're, you're trying to tell them you're in pain, but they're just looking at you like, huh? So as far as my impact, it makes me happy when I'm there and they need me to translate because I could offer that. I could ask what the patient needs and the patient feels a lot better that he could communicate with somebody because um, it decreases their anxiety. They know that there's somebody that they could talk to on the unit. Um, and don't get me wrong, my coworkers are awesome trying to um, um, just write down things on how to say it in the rooms. So like when I went into my patient's room who was on ECMO, there was a sheet that says, are you in pain? And then the translation, then is the Lord. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know who made that, but I appreciate you guys for trying. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, we're trying to learn Spanish. And, um, and these are my Caucasian colleagues like are, that are like, you know, giving the effort, I'm just like, I'm really proud of you guys. You guys are awesome. But I definitely know my impact when I when I come in and they're like, you speak Spanish? Okay, awesome. I just need to ask a few things. I was like, awesome. But there is a time where I do need to get a translative for like legal reasons and stuff like that because we're not allowed to translate as nurses sometimes because of um, our affiliation with the hospital. So we need a quote unquote third party to translate. But, excuse me, sometimes the translator is not available, so we have to do what we have to do sometimes, you know? Yeah, but that's... What? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Why would that, why would that be? Why, wouldn't, why would you need a third party to translate? Right, so a lot of the reasons why is because if we... For my, it's, like a, it's a legal reason for some reason. It's kind of like... Um, you need somebody that's not affiliated with the hospital to translate just to make sure there's no bias regarding what procedures or um, med- like and more so for procedures, so to speak, to make sure that the patient understands it. And sometimes if it's more about their kind of care too and it starts getting a little complex, then you need somebody from a translation company or like uh, whoever is providing those translators to just do it because so, then they wouldn't be affiliated with the hospital. It would be just a third party so that way there's no um, concern for bias, biases. But that's just one of the legal reasons why. But um, when you're, I mean, you can't get a translator to ask. I mean, you can't get a translator all the time sometimes. So, okay, I mean, as far as like speaking to this patient in Spanish, that's um you know it's a lot easier to do like that sometimes are there concerns about the costs of care among your patients yes ecmo itself is a very expensive um treatments to have so when i look at um some of the things i see in the patient's charting i see out of network my first thought is, is there somebody sponsoring this patient? Is there somebody, or is there like a charity or something that's able to help them out? And if I don't see them, my next question is, how much is this gonna cost them? 
how much of an impact is it going to affect everybody in this patient's family? Um, I mean, I think people don't realize the financial burden that will get placed if they ever get sick with COVID, depending on how their body reacts, because they could go either way, right? It could go between you just need to be put on oxygen for a little while just to help your body to either getting ventilated or, God forbid, put on ECMO, and then those things start to escalate costs. And then you want to talk about the different type of medications we're trying to give to help with the whole virus thing, like the antivirals that you hear about in the news, um, the plasma from positive COVID um, recipients that donate their plasma, like that in itself is expensive to get. Um, and a lot of these things are just like trial and, error th try, try and error things. So even if it doesn't work, you're still going to get charged for it. So I think that's one of my concerns. And uh, I asked my colleagues once I would get a report during the day, I asked them if social services on for this patient to see what kind of uh, help they can get once they get discharged. Just because I, I just advocate for them. It's going to be a cost. It's going to be a pretty big bill to have once they get discharged and they start looking for their money, you know. How, what's the support been like from management and from the community for the work that you guys are doing? So funny story, actually. Uh, one of our CEOs got positive for COVID. <laughs> so you've been very supportive. <laughs> We've been, uh, I, I'm happy to say, I'm, I'm very happy to be working for Advocate Aurora Healthcare because they've been very supportive, especially the community. I mean, they would have bus parades and have people with masks, just, you know, um, celebrating our efforts and everything like that. And they have the heroes work for your sign. But all that aside, oh, and plus all the food that you we get from working in the COVID units, that's okay as long as, like, you know, it's not in the units themselves, right? Um, they, our CEOs, like the top management, like at the very top, all of them took 50% pay cuts from their salaries to support the efforts and the cost that has been associated with the whole pandemic. Um, we've been getting COVID pay and hazard pay. We've been getting all that stuff with our differentials. Um, so even if we weren't working directly with COVID patients, we were getting surge pay just for coming to work and just taking care of patients and stuff like that. And it was it was a good it was I mean it was a pretty good deal, you know. I mean I didn't see a lot of, I didn't hear a lot of hospitals doing that. I didn't hear the Loyolas or the UICs or the Northwesterns doing something like that. But I mean I think a lot of it, you know. Just me talking about Advocate Aurora, right? Like Aurora Healthcare or um, Advocate Healthcare. I mean, like, that's where I'm at, right? I wasn't really too worried about those other uh, networks. But I believe it was pretty, like, the, our um, network is pretty supportive with everything that we've been going through as far as, you know, having to take care of these patients and stuff like that. And they've been pretty awesome with uh, respecting our mental health, too. Um, we actually got books from our um, leadership so that we could write some of our stories down and, you know, with patient confidentiality, they would post like different stories in our emails just to know like, hey, we're all going through this together. So they, they've been very, very supportive as far as just making sure everybody's okay and making sure that um, our voices are being heard and our stories are being, stories are being shared too. There was an incident back in April, I believe, um, where one of the Latino patients, uh, the doctor had left a voicemail for his family and they left, they left the microphone on. Um, did, did you hear about that? No. Can you okay. explain to me what happened? Basically, this was not, this, this was a doctor that was, a, uh, had, privileges there, but was not employed by uh, advocate. 
but she had she she left it on and, and she had they could hear in the background the family could hear in the background that she was saying don't give chest compressions uh this this person is going to die anyway we've done everything for them and it really upset the family it was a it was a latinx family um the one of the reasons i bring it up is it really underscored to me you know you had talked about advocating for the patients um around cost issues this whole situation with family not being able to be in the room and advocating for their family member, that's created a situation that I, I wonder if you would like to, to talk about that. How, how does the patient get advocated for when there's no one there in the room to do that for them and the family? Right, and I forgot to mention about the visitor restriction so that happened in the beginning. So yeah, during that, during the, I mean, the visitor restriction has leaned down a little bit, but going back to that certain instance, um, it really depends on, I mean, I didn't hear this story too much. Um, I didn't even hear it from like my colleagues as well, but when it was just the patient with no families and stuff like that, the, the pay for the families would have to keep calling us and um, imagine having two to three patients at a time and all the families are trying to get updates and see what's going on. Um, it is difficult. There's no easy way to say it. And, and as far as that situation goes, I could just imagine, I mean, I, I would have to see how the patient was looking like um, if this patient was truly getting everything that they needed to get. Um, I say I would have spoken to, I mean, the doctor should have spoken to the family first to see what their, I guess, code status was. That, that would be the correct terminology to put it, um, to see if we're going to do everything we can or if we're not going to do, or if we're just going to, you know, let them pass if the time comes. But before we even get to that conversation, the conversation has to happen with the family first. Um, I could see in the beginning too when things started to get really hectic. It was one of those things as far as like limited supplies versus great amount of patients, and you had to all allocate which which would which, who's going to be the priority, who's going to be allocated those supplies. Um, and you're saying this was about a month or two ago. Uh, I believe it was in April, and it was just you know it was a mistake. It was an open mic situation and and you know in the hubbub of trying to care for people and stuff they just they they didn't end the voicemail when they wanted to and so the family heard more than they were intended to hear about but it, it just it kind of brought up the question to me of you know and if you have your family member in the hospital you want to be there to ask questions to advocate, to, to find out as much as possible, especially when um, the patient isn't necessarily able to do that 100%. And now we're in a situation where, you know, when the family's not allowed to be there, uh, that must put a, a strain both on the family, but also on you as a, as a provider. Yeah, so I guess if, if, it, was, if it was me in that situation, because um, a lot of nurses, they, they want to make sure, one, that the patient is comfortable and making sure that the patient, you know, has certain wishes already in place to make sure if that time comes, we already know what they want, right? But a lot of times it's not the case. So what I would do is just see how they're looking like. Can they move anything? Can they move yes or no? Is the patient being responsive? Like a lot of the things that I would do is just making sure if we're getting anything back or if we're, um, you know, getting any type of response from them. Like if they're still able to answer yes and no, at the very least, then, you know, it's just a lot, it's a very, very tough position to be in. And at that time too, you say in April, doctors are having to make those decisions left and right because of the limited amount of resources that were available. I just, I guess at the end of the day, I wish that doctor didn't have the mic on like that because I'm pretty sure the message was um, very sincere and very, um, 
pay for it to the beginning, but after the voicemail was done, it was more blunt and direct and you know what I mean? And that's just how the field is sometimes with those cutthroat decisions. You know, I mean, a lot of it's just, this is what we're doing. What else have we done? And it's very blunt and doesn't really, you know, because I, I could see where the thought is coming from too. I just wish they made sure that the voicemail was over with. But um, to answer your uh, question about advocating for patients who don't have family members, that's the responsibility of the nurses at that point because we don't have family members advocating for their uh, loved ones who are in the hospital, especially with those visitor restrictions. And so the nurses are the ones that have to keep updating on what's going on with their family members constantly, even throughout the night too. I do get phone calls at like one or two in the morning and they're asking like, hey, how's he doing? Like, what's going on? And you could hear people being very anxious about like, hey, like, they're losing sleep over their uh, family members being in the hospital. They can't see them. They can't, you know, talk with them. They can't touch them. They can't hold them. I, I understand that completely. Like, it's a scary situation to be in. And family members were only allowed to come if um, they were going to pass. And so they would come in for about an hour or two. And, no, about an hour. I think it was only one hour. Say their goodbyes, and then that's it. It's a very difficult position to be in. That's a lot of pressure on you to have to talk to the family over the phone and try to. Yeah, and, and then uh, a lot of that, a lot of those conversations too. I mean, I feel like, um, I, I don't care if I put this for the record, I felt like I had to give them a little bit more than I should have because I felt like, you know, just some things weren't told, being told, and then a lot of those things were more so in the scope of the doctor. But I was just being very, I mean, at some points in time, I was just being very sincere with them and just being like, this is actually what's going on and this is what they're thinking. So a lot of the times I would tell them like, this is, what I'm telling you is more so out of my scope of practice to be telling you and letting them know that, that hey, I'm now I'm putting my wrist to tell you that this is what's going on. But, and then I would, I would tell them what questions to ask when the doctor comes. And I would guide their conversation with like telling them, the, ask these questions when the doctor comes so that way you'll be know what this means and I'll tell you what this means. Mm -hmm. Because I had a friend of mine whose mother was in the hospital for about a month and um, I had to really, really nitpick everything that he was saying to actually tell him what happened to his mom when, he, when she first came in. And you could just see well, I see, well, as far as my point of view, you could, I could see how much jargon there is in the medical field. Like, if you don't know somebody who is in this field, a lot of the words and terminology just sounds like a big, like, blur. And if you don't know what those mean, you could get very, you could get lost with the, with the lingo and the jargon very quickly. Excuse me. And so when he was telling me a lot of the things that uh, they were being taught to him, I was able to put the puzzle together and tell them, yeah, your mom went septic when she came into the hospital and that's why they had to start this and that. And because she wasn't breathing right on two different um, machines before they intubated her, that's why they escalated it that quickly. And the reason why she wasn't peeing is because of those numbers, because they were very high and that tells us your mom had kidney damage because she went septic, because there wasn't oxygen going to the kidneys. And when he put it like that, he was just like, oh, my God, that's what that meant. Like, yeah, that's what that means. But now that she's peeing, she's probably in the, now that she's peeing, she was probably getting transferred to regular floors now. So imagine having to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And then I told my friend, too, what to ask the nurse and what to ask the doctors. Cause that was scary. I mean, I was thinking about his mom like for about one or two weeks when I was training in the ICU because I mean, this is my childhood friend and his mom got um, COVID and it was just crazy. When I found that out, I ended up um, sending some um, cleaning supplies like wipes and um, lies so so that way they could just clean everything and make sure that they stay clean. 
So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about um, your life as a Lat Latinx family during COVID. What What is your living situation? So um, I currently, I mean, as far as um, me living with my family, as soon as I started actually going to COVID units, I moved out immediately. I didn't want to stay at home with my parents with all this going on. So I moved out. I moved out right away and I told them like, I have to do this because I don't want to bring it home. I don't want to expose you guys to it because it's no secret. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm like in the front, I was gonna be in the front line. And as soon as they told me, yeah, you're going to the COVID unit. I was like, okay. You got my stuff, and I told them I have to move out. So I stayed two weeks at a co-worker's place, and then I found my own place in Pilsen, which is a lot closer. But um, <coughs> but in the beginning, I mean, I was living with my folks, and it ended up being a routine that we ended up getting our wallet, keys, and masks. So that's pretty much... Um, I mean, I, I can't really answer too many questions. Like, I can't answer too much about it just because, I mean, I just moved out away from my family just to make sure they weren't getting exposed. How are, how are they doing? They're doing okay. Um, my brother, he graduated virtually, which was something I never thought would happen. But um, I guess there's a lot of creativity going around with the whole pandemic happening. Um they when um when everybody had to stay at home because I, I think it happened during screen break so everybody was home originally and then they extended it by a week and then they were like yeah we're not having anybody come back to school so it was funny seeing them in class with like 20 little screens on like uh on zoom or like whatever program they were using and that was their class they were just sitting in the other room just with their headphones on, listening to the teachers. And then you could see some of the kids just goofing off on the, um, <laughs> cause they're in their rooms. I mean, what are you gonna tell them? Stop doing that, you're getting on the tension? What, like, it was funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was interesting, man. It was, um, I never thought I'd see that they were, a class would actually be virtual, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, that's all I can answer with that. How have you maintained relations with your family since since you're out of the house now? Right. So, I mean, I call them and let them know how everything is going. Um, so for my brother and sister's birthday, I um, I said to them, happy birthday. I told them, you know, I, I mean, you know why I can't be there, but um, I ordered some shoes for them. They, re they really liked it. And it wasn't like, they were good shoes. I'll, I'll give. You I'll, I'll just put it that way. They were really nice shoes, and I saw them take care of them. Okay, <laughs> but um, I was I was able to visit the house once. But when I visited, um, I took I I grabbed gloves and I wore the mask and I just um was trying to minimize touching as much things as possible because I needed to pick up some mail. So but that's kind of like how I've been being very uh cautious with my family members with that because the last thing I need to do is give them COVID because we've also had stories about family members being tested for tested positive for COVID and then it's not necessarily them that have to go to the hospital but it's their mom or dad that ends up getting the virus and it's not a it's not a good feeling to have when you know you're the reason why they get tested positive. So why did you decide to become a healthcare professional? And how has the COVID situation affected how you feel about that career choice? Um, so my decision to become a healthcare um, provider stems from my mother, because again, I, I wanted to just work on traits. I wanted to get a trade and just graduate high school and start doing that. Cause I, I, I used to, when I was a kid, I really liked working on cars. I wanted to, build cars and make them go faster and we think I'm Paul Walker or something, right? Um, and my mom uh, sat me down one day and she was just like me, but like, you're going to do this for the rest of your life. You're going to be hustling for a job. You know, why don't you go to college and become a nurse? You know, it's the same concept. You're trying to fix something and you like talking to people. You're a people person. That's perfect. Why don't you give it a try? 
And so that's when I enrolled in going to NIU because they had a really good nursing program. Let me say, let me let me uh, add one more adjective to that. They had a good and rigorous nursing class, uh, a nursing program. I, did, oh, I still get PTSD about that. Um, but I, I graduated and made it through, and now I'm a healthcare provider. Now, as far as how I feel about it with the whole COVID pandemic, um, I feel like. I made a right decision being in this field because not only do I get to be an advocate for my Latinx community, but I also uh, like interacting with people and um, making sure that they're okay. Um, nine times out of 10, my COVID patients are grateful that, you know, they're there, they're alive and, you know, they're fighting as much as they can with it. And sometimes I'm just there to make sure that the patients are comfortable for their last remaining hours on this in this world to make sure, you know, they go out, you know, peacefully and comfortably if they if it's to that point. So I feel like I really do make an impact, especially right now with the whole pandemic going on, because nurses are the honestly, nurses are probably the only ones going into those rooms. And we're getting infected too. What are your thoughts on how leadership and society in general have treated your particular concerns um, as a healthcare worker? So I like to put it this way, there is these blue towns and then there's these red towns, right? And I don't think I gotta go into the specifics of what those colors mean, but in the blue towns, we see a lot of people wearing masks, following all the, you know, CDC guidelines of how to prevent infection. But in the red towns, nobody's wearing a mask. You put on a mask and everybody's looking at you weird. And that pretty much tells me, I mean, to me, when you're not doing that, it just pretty much tells me you don't care. Like you want to not protect yourself or your family. I mean, I'm not, that's just me in first impressions. You're not wearing a mask. You probably you really don't care then. Um, but don't get me wrong. I mean, if you're outside, right, and you're maintaining six feet away, and you're not standing next to somebody that's not crowded, and I mean, I, I get it. You don't have to wear a mask because there's nobody around you. You're outside in the air. But if you can maintain six feet away, at least wear a mask. You know, like when you go to a store, like wear a mask. There's a lot of people out in the store. But you have people that don't wear a mask or they put a bleed below their nose and you're just like, all right, whatever. I'll see you soon. I mean, <laughs> I'll see you soon. I mean, I, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, if, if that's how you want to treat it, then I'll see you soon. I mean, at this point in time, it's, 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 I don't know when and where this became a political issue to wear a mask. I don't know when and where it became a political issue to try to contain a pandemic. I don't know where it went wrong, but I am just frustrated. And that's why when I was talking about social media, like everybody thinks we're taking away freedoms about wearing, because you have to wear a mask. It just blows my mind. And it makes me very frustrated because you're not seeing what we're seeing. You're not seeing what it's actually doing to people. And, and it's not like it's just like people who have comorbidities too. These are some of these patients are just my age and like they can't breathe. Um, they're not they're having difficulty breathing and stuff like that. Like, and it, it's only one explanation is COVID. And then for them to be like, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask because I have the freedom to choose not to wear a mask. But like, right, but you're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, like wearing a mask is a, at the very least one thing you could do. So it's frustrating. You would think this stuff is common sense, but it's not so common. And uh, apparently this goes against the Constitution. Most people don't even know what the Bill of Rights are. <laughs> so uh, this pandemic has come about in the middle of also a, a resurgence of social movements, particularly the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. Could you talk a little bit about your history um, as an activist, if, if you have that history, and what this current moment, um, 
how you've been able to participate or not in, in that? Um, so when I was in NIU, I was involved in a couple of organizations to, you know, speak, I mean, pretty much be a voice for people and, um, as far as like social movements for, I'm not, cause I remember Black Lives Matter was, uh, was really big between the years of like 2017, 2018, when it was starting to come out. So I was able to support that. I was also able to support um, un undocumented students that were on campus as well. I also took our student positions or student leadership positions on campus and tried to listen to the folks that knew a little bit more of how to help with those communities because in the beginning, like in, during my time in NIU, I was more of a student in how I could help. And if I was able to be put in a position to give financial needs or anything like that through a student leadership role, I was more than happy to help. So I did do a, a lot of things regarding that stuff as far as um, going to, um, um, what's it called, Dream Action. Um, meetings and stuff like that as much as I could um, and I was able to sit down and um, advocate for um, student uh, policies that could be passed to help more um, communities of color and you know give funding to a lot of uh, black events as well too so as far as my um, activism I felt like it was it was there I, I think I could have done more with it when I was in NIU, but I was able to ask for help on how I could help. Um, currently, um, I was able to participate in some protests on, in Pilsen when they were doing some walks. Um, as far as what was happening in the riots, I tried to stay away as much as possible. <laughs> um, but um, I, haven't been able, I haven't been able to do too much with it right now just because I feel like my focus is more on the front lines and just making sure I take care of patients and making sure that they're okay and just making sure I'm okay with getting sleep and just making sure I talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. But I, to be perfectly honest with you, I wish I could do more. It, it must be a concern as well, uh, given your exposure in your job to want to be out on the street, you know, mm -hmm. potentially. But affecting um, other people. Yeah, but I did. I did expose my brother because when I was when the riots were happening, I, I was moving um, that weekend, and I brought my little brother, who's uh, he's half black, half Guatemalan, so he's you know a mixture of both communities. You know that's pretty awesome, right? Um, but um, I, I took him down, down and I showed him what was happening, and he pretty much um, hit me with his question is. He asked me, is this happening because I'm black? And that was a question I could not answer. The only thing I could give him was my per uh, perception, but that was more of a question to ask his father, who is black. But I think just as far as educating my family, or at least my little brothers, when they start asking those questions. He's 12 years old and he's a bright kid. Like he's already asking that question. So I, I told him you have to speak to your father what is really going on. Because I couldn't speak on behalf of that community. But I know that my stepfather was able to have that conversation definitely. Is there anything else you'd like to share with me about your experiences with COVID-19 that I haven't asked about? Um, I guess one question I do have for you is how has, I don't know if you can answer this question, but are the participants of this uh, project that's going on, have they been sharing a similar experiences with what I've been going through, um, not as a healthcare provider, but just as a Latinx person? Um, you're really, uh the first interview that I've had, I have, I have interviewed a few healthcare workers. Um, you have the most direct experience with being, you know, in the front lines with that. But yeah, some of, some of the comments are, are similar along the same lines of some of the, the Latinx 
uh, provider aspects and just the how life has become complicated, you know, because of the pandemic, both in the family situation and also also at work. So, yeah, it's been it's been very interesting. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that just that just makes me aware of like this isn't just me that's going through it too. It's, it's everybody that's been having interactions with this pandemic. Um, but yeah, it's been it's a bit, it's been a very interesting time that we're living in. There's a lot of uh, things that are happening all at once. This has definitely been that year for sure. And then I just never knew that it was gonna just hit all at once. <laughs> And it's only July, man. <laughs> well, I, I really want to thank you, Luis, for sharing your story with us and, uh, and with future scholars and others to help them understand uh, what it was like experiencing this moment in history. Yeah, no, definitely. This is definitely something I'm going to put on my resume for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was great just uh, letting that out, I think. This really did help me with my mental health too, just explaining my story. I mean, I feel like I've been, the more and more I've been explaining it, the more and more I've been feeling um, better about what I've been doing. Great. Sure. Oh, I was going to also say too, um, I could just send you those pictures through your email, correct? I did have a couple of pictures that I um, borrowed from the internet. <laughs> but is it okay if I send them to the email that you send me the uh, Zoom? 